Hello everyone and welcome back to Content Warfare TV. This is the first time we've had a show in over a month. We will talk about another time, why that has been. Maybe you listened to the last uh, audio-only podcast episode and got a little taste for that. But I have a guest that I am very excited to have because, uh, as you guys know, I um, though I, I don't think I'm very good at it, that's why I have him on, I love video and I love video marketing and we have the DIY video guy with us, Caleb Wojcik. Caleb, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I see your little video light back there. Whether or not you use it, it's it's there. It's in existence right there. I see it. I, I do. I actually, uh, you wouldn't, you may not, um, you may not believe this or not, but literally directly above my head is an entire uh, video studio where we have like, and again, this is like hacked up amateur mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm going to be picking your brain for whether I've done it right or not. Okay, uh, cool. But. Um, you know, we have like egg cartons on the walls. I mean, we're you know complete, complete geeked out on that kind of stuff. But um, before we get there, I want to talk about you know when we start focusing on me. Let's talk about you a little bit and learn a little bit about uh, you have had. So I first came across your work uh, when you were doing uh, your blog was still mostly finance related, and mm -hmm. you still had your corporate job. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of talk a little bit about that and and all these transitions you've had and growth and just. Um, what has gotten you to kind of what you're you're getting into today? Yeah, so I used to work at the Boeing company. Uh, I worked there for three and a half years after college. Uh, the first couple of years, I got my MBA at night, and then I was just kind of figuring out, like, okay, what do I want to do next kind of thing. And through my own journey of, like, wanting to understand money because I was making more than I really needed at that point, I stumbled upon, like, Get Rich Slowly, The Simple Dollar, some other personal finance blogs, and a few months after reading some of those and learning some things, I started my own personal finance site called Pocket Change, which um, I no longer run anymore, but it was how I first got into this whole world of blogging and making content and connections with people on the web. And so that was kind of my first foray into doing any like online business stuff. Through that, I got connected with Corbett Barr, who was running a site called Think Traffic, and I went to work with him. Um, and I left Boeing completely to go work with him full time. And then I just left working with him uh, after working with him for about three years or so. And we moved on to building this thing called Fizzle, which Chase Reeves joined us with. And we had a podcast and a video uh, training library and community there. So that's kind of the quick uh, what the last three or so years has been of me doing stuff online. Yeah, I actually uh, have followed you guys all the way through Fizzle. I love what you did there. I was a member for a while, and then I had a child, and I had to step back, not because I didn't find it valuable, but because right. when you have a a very young child, it's a, you have only so much Less time. time. Yeah. Um, but I've actually, uh, for those who've been following the show for a while, we've had Chase on, we've had Corbett on, so we've talked about oh, uh, cool. that product a lot. I want to talk about, um, so I... In the context of Fizzle, what oh, so the content was great, but I and again I have the video light behind me. I put it there for a reason because I love video. I think it's very powerful in the way that you can convey messages. Um, and you know what, the videos in Fizzle are amazing, right? High, high quality, incredible stuff. Um, we're gonna boil down into into. Um, how you do some of that and give some mm -hmm. tips and talk about that kind of stuff for people in a second. But I want to talk a little bit about um, what you're doing now out on your own. So now you've mm -hmm. kind of – and I and I'm, I was just reading the, the blog post again that you wrote uh, about this, this step, kind of explaining mm -hmm. this step, moving away from Fizzle. Uh, what was it that um, – because I, I just love these stories. What mm -hmm. was it that kind of captures you and said, okay, uh, I've been talking, I've been helping people do this for so long, it's time for me to do it. What was kind of that moment or if there was one that, that you knew it was time? Yeah, I think it was just after a amount of years of you know helping people build their businesses and what we were building at Fizzle and being a part of a team there, I kind of just wanted to see if I could do it myself. And I knew this direction of video stuff was the direction I wanted to go because that's what all my friends were asking me about, uh, feedback on what kind of stuff they were buying, how to set things up properly, as well as I had clients that I was doing video production for on the side a little bit when I was working at Fizzle for a time. And then that was one of my main roles at Fizzle. So it just made logical sense that would be the direction that I would go. And it just came down to the fact that 
I was ready to build my own thing and kind of become a case study of the kinds of people that were helping at Fizzle. Uh, so you would say that like a lot of the okay. So this is uh, uh, Caleb Wojcik Films is what mm -hmm. you're talking about, mm -hmm. and then uh, that is the kind of business arm of what you're doing. And then DIY video guy uh, CalebWojcik.com, and I'll have links mm -hmm. to all this stuff in the show notes for everyone who's listening later. And I have a link to the DIY video blog in the detail section of the event page for anyone who's watching live right now. Though I would encourage you to stick with us until after the show to visit. <laughs> um, uh, so, so DIY video guy is kind of the marketing arm, you know, sharing your thoughts, your expertise, getting that out there, and then you have a separate property which explains the actual business business itself. Is that that's correct? So everyone's kind of clear on where your properties are. Yeah, it's more like DIY video guy is where I'm teaching people that need to make videos by themselves, like how to do it. Yeah. Whereas Kilowatt Films is like you can hire me and I will come make those videos and help you with the strategy or maybe help you set up your studio or something like that. It's more like the one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting arm of the things that I do, whereas DIY Video Guy, I'm going for scale of helping as many people as I can with tutorials and strategy and stuff like that. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love. I, I like both sides of it. I think a lot of people, uh, when, they're, when they're stepping out on their own... Um, they're too narrowly focused. I don't know. Do you watch The Profit at all with uh, Marcus Lamanis? Oh no, my I haven't gosh. seen that before. You, I, you know, the kind of guy that you are, just from listening to you and the podcast and stuff, I think that you'll love it. I watched it for the first time a week ago, and he said something that I thought was very interesting, and it's, it's just a really, really fun show, and uh, I like that kind of stuff. But um, he said uh, a lot of businesses, small businesses in particular, get so hung up on the one thing that they're good at. Like the common not logic is there's one thing that you do and do that one thing and, and be the best. And I, and I do think there's good advice there. But in order to scale your business, you really have to offer multiple offerings. And, and was that part of your decision or just you like doing both? Well, I do like doing both, but I think part of it is to cater to the full breadth of what people are looking for, there are going to be people that you know, are on the budget and on the low end of video stuff that are just getting started and there needs to be something there to help them. But then there are people that have established businesses that would rather just hire someone to come and shoot videos and help them with the overall strategy of like launching a YouTube show or doing a video podcast or something like that. And so I was planning to do both of those things and they also keep me, they both keep me fresh because I'm learning new things to teach new people things, but I'm also put into different ex like experiences with client work to help me then teach people their different things so they help each other. Yeah, it's funny. Um, good friend of the show, Marcus Sheridan, refers to his clients not as clients but as case studies mm -hmm. because every single one is different and every single one teaches it all him a lesson that he then can share with his audience on the sales line. So that just makes complete mm -hmm. sense to me. Mm -hmm. I love that whole strategy. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you the most foundational question when it comes to this stuff, uh, and and, and uh, probably not the most interesting question, but I at least want to start here, and that's why video. Like this is actually right? perfect. This is actually the second episode of my podcast, and it's like in the beginning of my book, DIY Video Guide. So go ahead. So why video? Let's rock and roll. From there. Yeah. So so to me, there are three formats, uh, three broad formats that you can share content. I mean, this is content podcast right here. So there's three. Yep. There's written, audio, and video. And they're all good and bad at certain things. To me, written is the quickest. It's the easiest to create. You just can write something, you can edit it, and you can publish it. And also, people can skim written content. Um, it shows up in search engines more. And depending on what you're doing, it's maybe a better format, maybe like a step-by-step -step thing might be better in text format with screenshots and stuff like that. Audio, on the other hand, you can get more of someone's time with audio than you can with the other two. So like this, for example, is a podcast and people are driving, they're out for a run, they're, they're doing something else while they're consuming audio because it's just one of your senses. Whereas when you're reading or watching a video, you're pretty much focused on that one thing you need to be really doing something else. You can't be watching a video and driving or reading and driving or something. So audio is really good for that kind of thing. Long form things, conversations, um, inspirational type things, like obviously audiobooks and things like that people consume on the go. 
And then there's video, which kind of falls somewhere in between. Like written content, you're lucky to get a minute or two of someone's time as they like quickly scroll through an article. Audio, you could get a couple hours of someone's time. There's this podcast to listen to called Hardcore History, and the episodes are like four hours long. And like, how are you going to get someone to read your blog for four hours? I don't know. That's impossible. But then video is somewhere in the middle where it needs someone's full attention. They can't skim through it. And it's the easiest way to show who you actually are, who your business is, to show your personality, uh, maybe some humor to um, actually teach a little bit better because you can show visually what you're doing. So like for me, when I'm teaching video things and I have to walk through a program on a computer, it would take me forever to write that out or to try to explain it over audio. But if I can just share my screen with someone and they can like see what I'm doing, then that makes the most sense. So in my opinion, it's not just like only doing one of these things. I think to have a proper like content strategy, you have to do all of these things, really. Do you think it makes sense to focus on one over the other? Like, uh, say, take like uh, uh, Serena Rao and Unmistakable Creative, right? He is primarily a podcast, and mm -hmm. then he does do some writing um, mm -hmm. that is taken different forms as he's kind of uh, matured in his work. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he's primarily a podcast. Say, um, I was probably primarily written, and then over the last say eighteen months, I've transitioned more to primarily say audio and and video. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you should pick one and the other supplement it, or is and and I guess this is a broad question because it depends on your business model. But as a general rule, does it make sense to kind of mix all three? Well, I think it makes sense to mix all three if you have the capacity to do so. I know that if you're just doing everything by yourself, it can be really hard to do all three, especially if you do video and audio. Audio as one person is doable, and like specifically Srini, what he's creating out of conversation, which it makes sense to do in audio form. And so he's picked that and focused on it. One thing I don't think you should do is commit to doing all three and start doing all three at the same time. I think it makes more sense to maybe start with blogging because that's the easiest to produce, the easiest to get things out there. Then maybe you progress to audio, and then maybe you progress to video. And it's just kind of that's a that's a standard progression that a lot of people go through. Um, but if whatever you're doing or teaching, if it makes sense to start in one of those other ones, there's no reason why you couldn't just go like gung-ho fully into one. I mean, there's YouTube personalities out there that don't write or podcast, and then there's people that just podcast and don't write that are super popular, like Mark Maron or something like that. So... I think you can just pick one and build a business around it, but I think that there's probably some opportunity to do all three, just level loaded across the kinds of things you want to create. Yeah. It seems to me like it, it like if you're a personal brand, if that's what your shtick is, then maybe it makes more sense to just be one, right? So if you're mm -hmm. a personal brand and really just focus on one because but if you're a if you're a business, even a small business, then it seems to make more sense to you know you think of yourself more as a as a media company. Right? I know that's kind of mm -hmm. buzzy, but uh, and in that regard, you need to create content across the stroke of a, of a, of a, or the landscape of available media formats because different part different consumer bases inside your audience are going to want to consume it in different ways. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, so that so okay, so so that's kind of why video, right? That that's the the answer to why video is there is going to be a certain segment of your audience that wants to consume video versus reading or listening mm -hmm. to an audio podcast. They're going to yeah, want gonna, that connection. Yeah, and there's going to be a part of your audience that will consume anything you make. Yeah. So you want to also give them like different ways that they can consume it because sometimes I'm in the mood to listen to something, sometimes I'm in the mood to watch something, sometimes I'm in the mood to read something. And a lot of the people that I follow only do one of those. But if there were a couple people that did all three of them, I would consume all of that stuff. Um, I just want to quickly, and I agree with you, I just want to quickly address, uh, Preston made a comment about the app. Anyone who's watching live right now, um, I'll look into why you're having to have the video and the event page open in different spots. So uh, I do apologize for that. I just I, I apologize, Caleb. I had a couple people commenting that um, something's going on with the app. So no, uh, okay. we'll figure that out. For those listening... Completely disregard. You will. It impacts you not at all uh, if you're listening later on the podcast. So, uh, so let's talk about this. Um, what are the different uses for video? Because this is something that I get asked a lot. And again, I'm not. I don't consider myself 
a video expert in any regard. I use it, I dabble, I test, I try, but um, I'm not an expert. So where are the places that someone should be considering using video? Home page, landing pages, like what are the different uses of video that say a standard small business or solopreneur would consider creating video for? Yeah, I think the biggest one is either like your home page or your about page, like explaining what it is you do. That's a very common first video that people kind of go into because video is the way that people can just push play, sit back and consume it and you can like tell them something as opposed to them having to scroll through a page or pick the different parts of your website to figure out what it is that you actually do. And video can be really compelling. It can convince people to do a certain thing like videos for restaurants or showing like food would make you like go to that restaurant faster than just like looking at a menu because it's not as visually appealing and stuff. So like a home and about video is good. Any of your sales pages or any of your product pages or services pages, maybe you do coaching or I am consulting or something like that. Those would be perfect pages to have videos on as well. And you get a lot of people that put them like right at the top of their sales pages and some of them are super long, some are super short, but it's just a different way for people to consume what you're trying to tell them and if you want to work with them, like showing them the kinds of things you do, maybe there's some case studies in there from your clients like you were talking about earlier. Those are two of the main things. So like an intro to what you do and then an intro to like what you offer people. Gotcha. And this would be, I, I hear a lot of people talk about things uh, like explainer videos, right? This would be yeah. maybe on your about page or uh, I know the one that gets tossed around all the time is uh, crazy, crazy Eggs Explainer. Everyone loves that explainer video and, and animation. Um, so when when does it make sense to use like a talking head video? I'm the president. I'm gonna sit here and and give you my shtick. I'm versus some sort of um, like one of those uh, hand scribble videos yeah. or an animate something that's not the human. Uh, when you're considering these videos, when should you use one versus the other? Well, I think it kind of depends on what it is your company does. A lot of those you know animated ones or hand drawn ones, those are more kind of describing what an app does or what your company does or something like that as opposed to showing people on screen where it's like about who the company is like showing like some employees talking uh, just off camera or something like that versus okay we have this app and the best way to explain it to you because it's kind of confusing is to show you a video yeah so that's that's typically the separation between the two I think that both can work in either situation, but I think that the animated, hand-drawn ones, those are typically cheaper to get produced versus the other ones where you have like a video company kind of like shoot video and stuff. So I think that's maybe one of the reasons people also go that direction. Yeah, and dealing with humans is probably a lot more difficult than dealing with animations, right? Yeah, right. exactly. Trying to get a human to listen to you and do the things that you want them to do. I, I, I do some uh, some video production for the independent insurance agency that's actually next door to the building I'm in now that I used to work for. And what's funny is that um, of the the four owners, um, being my father-in-law and my wife's extended family, um, trying to get each one of them to do to say the things and do the things that I want them to do, it's like a, a completely unique challenge with each one and kind of how do I get this one to sound a little more uh, full of life and how do I get this one to tone down and why does this one's voice go up seven octaves? Yeah. And and I, I feel like that's it's not just them. I mean, that's everybody. And when you're dealing with humans, there's just this whole other element to, to getting right. quality video. Right, exactly. As opposed to just hiring a voiceover person to just yeah. talk through what you want them to say. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to get into some of the like um, the the, the kind of nitty gritty stuff here. Um, on the DIY side, how important is production quality? Right. So when it when can you do the handheld? Hi, I'm coming to you from the airport, and I'm going to drop this thought that I had on you. Versus, uh, you know, something like the studio that I built upstairs, which has like a, a nice white screen background and lights and I've tried to do all the different things that you're supposed to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I, see, I, I feel like a lot of people tr try to do the, I'm just going to do the quick quirky video 
And it seems to me like, yeah, Gary Vee can get away with that and maybe a couple other people, but you really have to have a certain kind of personality. Most of the time it makes more sense to kind of be a little more put together. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on the place that you're putting it to. Like YouTube, I know, is a pretty decent one to do like that DIY kind of hold out your phone video as well as if you're putting it on like Instagram or Vine or something like that. But if it's going to go on your website permanently on like a home page or a sales page or maybe it's part of a paid product or it's part of your training of like how to use your app or how to use your software or something, those probably shouldn't be those kind of DIY things. But I think that part of that uh, spontaneity of making videos on the go like that is is a really good like doorway into people seeing that you're actually a real person. Someone that I think that does a really good job of that balance between like produced and like on the go kind of things is Pat Flynn of Smart Passive Income. Mm -hmm. He'll be at a conference and he'll shoot a little video in his hotel room like giving an update of how things are going. Um, like I was up with him in San Francisco and we were shooting some videos for uh, for his book that had videos within it and his site like completely crashed and he like had to 301 redirect his site to a video that we shot like in the streets of San Francisco and it was just like this quirky little thing where he's like hey I gotta go fix my website and then he just like ran away and so like we just shot that quickly it was like really DIY I mean I had a nice camera but we literally just went out in the street and like hit record for a minute ran back into a coffee shop and like posted it to YouTube and re 301 redirected the site so like when there's stuff happening quickly whether that's live events announcements um, <laughs> your site like going down completely you need to tell people about it because he had no way to contact his people other than like his email list his YouTube subscribers social media and stuff like that so there's kind of a mix between what should be produced and what could be that little DIY thing um, and so I think you just need to need to balance that and choose whether or not that DIY kind of look like holding your phone out really fits with your brand or if you want to go fully produced every time you make a video. Yeah, I, I agree. I remember when that happened to uh, Pat Flynn and, you know, Pat's the kind of guy where like you can pretty much mention anything that has to do with the internet and then just say, and Pat Flynn's a good example. <laughs> but um, uh, the thing, so I completely agree with you and, and, and just a, a point to build on there is I think when you do those random kind of I'm just going to pop the camera open videos, you also train yourself to be a little more composed when you are doing the more professional videos because you have to think off the cuff and you're trying not to input as many ums and ahs and that kind of stuff because you know, you're just trying to do a one take mm -hmm. uh, video and it almost like builds a, I don't want to say a habit, but but almost like a, it, it kind of like a habit in you of this is something I can share. You start to look into the world a little more for moments when you can share something with your audience uh, and then uh, you know I almost I'll use my Google Plus rule of thumb. Thoughts go into social media, resources on your site, that's kind of what my guide is. I share with my community all the time. It, maybe it makes sense for, for video users. Thoughts can go into these random things and your resources go into something that's a little more produced. Yeah and to make a video like oftentimes you can go into social media and ask questions and stuff to get people's opinion on what kinds of things you can then later shoot a video about to see like what things are popular based on how many people like or comment or favorite things as well as get some ideas for what to include in the video or I know people that ask those sorts of questions and then they'll show a little screenshot of the people that responded in social media and then they'll yeah. talk about that so you can use social media to share those thoughts and then when you're ready and those thoughts are a little bit more formulated then you could shoot a video on it. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. So we uh, fun part about Google Hangouts, you get people asking live questions and we have one here you've, uh, for you and it comes from Denver and Denver asks, I wonder what Caleb thinks of closed captions and uh, you know what is the you know, I said get the semantic search to hone in on the topic. I guess he's asking, you know, is there value to adding uh, closed captions, adding captioning to your videos? Uh, I, I'm assuming that he's targeting uh, YouTube because Hangouts are yeah. are captured in YouTube. Do you think that's something you should be doing? And does it have value um, in, for a video producer? So I think captions in general do have value because of how many people are maybe non-native English speaking 
or are watching videos maybe at work or something where they can't have headphones in. So captions definitely do help. They do take a lot more work to have done, meaning to hire someone to do the captions. You can turn on auto captions with YouTube. Um, sometimes they are hit or miss on the accuracy of what people are saying, but they're pretty good. It's about as good as like talking to Siri on your iPhone and like them picking up what you're saying. But if you actually are hiring someone, whether that's someone on Fiverr or an actual closed captioning company that can transcribe all your stuff, it, it is useful. These types of ones where it's like a conversation, um, in my opinion, might be a little less useful than like a talking head produced video. And oftentimes those ones are scripted out anyway, so you can just hand your script off to someone and they just have to set up the timing within YouTube of when you say the things. So that yeah. might be a little cheaper to take your videos that are scripted, have those put closed captions on them, and then that can then help you in search. Another thing you can do with the transcription instead of just putting it within the closed caption thing in YouTube is put it in the description on the YouTube video. I've seen full transcriptions there before, and like I don't know the weight personally of those in search engines, but it's better than not being there at all. So. That's why a lot of people are putting those transcriptions within the description as well as in the closed captioning button. Yeah. I would say, um, so I, and this is actually where, where, this is one of the things I wanted to ask you about with scripting in general, but I will say I, I script most of my produced videos mm -hmm. and the uh, YouTube has gotten very good at, ma if you give them the script and you stayed on script, uh, the auto timing is pretty good. Um, the auto timing is, is, is pretty good on YouTube. Not exact, but pretty good. So at a minimum, upload that script that you used, I would say for sure. That's definitely a best practice. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, let's get, I want to get your opinion on scripting. So, um, when do you script? When not do you script? What are some best practices? I have, a I use a, um, a, uh, uh, I bought a teleprompter, and I'm not on myself, so no one can see my hands going like this. Yeah. Um, but uh, a, a teleprompter, you put your iPhone on the base and then the camera behind it, and, and that's what I use for my script, and, and I use Google Drive, and, and that all connects. Uh, what are your thoughts on scripting? What's kind of some best practices around it, and when when should you versus when shouldn't you? I think that the specific videos that we were talking about, like the homepage video, the sales video, stuff like that, where you want to be very specific about what you say, it makes sense to script those out fully. Inside of Fizzle that we made, I would say 90% of the words that we say in that were scripted. And we didn't actually use a teleprompter. We would put the script next to us, and we would remember it and get as close to it as we could. Um, it was more just because, for us, it was a little more natural than reading off of a teleprompter. Definitely takes more time to do it that way. But being able to know that you're not reading something, it's just a little bit different of a feel, yeah. unless you're really good at it, unless you can read the teleprompter and no one really knows about it. Um, but when you should not use a teleprompter is like those off-the-cuff videos we were talking about where you know it's a little more DIY, it's like webcam, it's your phone, or maybe you're in your office, and maybe you just know the stuff a little better and you can just go off an outline and kind of ad lib here and there throughout the video. So if it's like a really pillar video where it's like the main video on your website or sales page, I would definitely script those. If it's within a course, you probably want to script it or at least do a pretty detailed outline. But if it is one of those off the cup videos or like you're doing a tutorial or like you're showing something, those are a little bit harder to script because you're not going to be like reading the script and like doing stuff on your screen at the same time. So yeah. it's kind of a toss-up of whether or not to script it. I prefer to script most of my videos, but I'm trying to get better about just trusting myself and going off a detailed outline of the things I want to cover. That's a really good comment you just made there. You definitely, when you go unscripted, you definitely have to trust yourself and have confidence. I 100% agree with that because uh, there have been times when I have gone unscripted on topics that, uh, maybe I felt really good about certain portions, but maybe there was a stat or a specific thing that I was adding in that I wasn't 100% sure of, and mm -hmm. it's almost like you can tell throughout the course of the video. Here's the part he wasn't 100% sure of, and here's where he was, and um, it, you definitely have to trust yourself. And if you do that, a lot of times people won't know the difference. Um, yeah, yeah. 
I, the the trick for for me for for tele, reading off teleprompter is to write like you talk, and that took a lot of practice. Um, and to really use punctuation well. So like the comma is super important because if, if you're reading and and you don't stop at that comma, you just blow past it like you're reading. People mm -hmm. immediately know that if that comma is there and you stick to the punctuation. Uh, then it, it does sound a little more natural, but I 100% agree with you. Um, it doesn't sound, it never sounds completely natural, but it can be close, but that oh, definitely takes work. So you probably haven't worked one way or the other, where right? you're memorizing it. or yeah, and Like if you're using a teleprompter, that means less work editing typically too, yeah. so that saves time there, but you have to spend more time you know, scripting it out exactly how you want yeah. it to. So it's it's kind of a toss-up of what you prefer. I think you could kind of do a few videos of each and then kind of see what feels most comfortable for you. Yeah. Let's um, let's move on to sound, right? Sound, so my understanding of sound, specifically on YouTube, is that you could have the same rotating pattern for your video. If your sound is excellent, you'll get people to listen longer than if you have amazing high quality images and really crappy sound. Is that is that accurate? Like how important is sound? Yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, some people make some examples of where it's like really crappy black and white grainy footage, but the sound is really good and you can watch it. But then if they flip it and the video is really good and the sound is like really, really bad, then you like can't stand watching it. And that's kind of the standard example people use to show that sound really does matter. And so you need to figure out like whatever you have equipment-wise can get you the best sound. Even if like in this example, we're doing a live hangout, I have this podcast microphone in front of my face, but more people, I'm assuming, are going to consume this via podcast form. Yeah, so... You, it just depends on like what's the most important thing, and since this will go to a podcast, sound is probably the most important out yeah. of this. And with Google Hangouts, you're not getting the best video quality. People already know that. It's webcams. It's completely scrunched down bandwidth-wise so that it's pixelated and stuff like that. But the sound quality is pretty good, and so that's the, the more important thing that you have to think about. Yeah, I know. I used to only record my uh, the first sixty episodes. Uh, Content Wars for our podcast was recorded via Skype, and um, that's actually how I interviewed Caleb or Caleb uh, Chase. Mm -hmm. And then um, all of a sudden, and uh, I guess it was to the fall of twenty thirteen, uh, the the audio capture from Hangouts to YouTube was drastically increased. And when that happened. Uh, then I switched over to Hangouts because I really like this format. You get to see the person, mm -hmm. and it's 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 more engaging. You get to get uh, good questions, like the one Denver just asked. Mm -hmm. um, but the audio capture is very good. Not not perfect, but but definitely good enough to be used as an audio only uh, a capture. And and it's really and, that, and that's how I had Corbett on uh, that version. So you get to you can almost see if. I don't know why I'm using them as examples, mostly just because uh, you guys are all buddies, but, um, but you, know, you use both. So, okay, so sound is important. So we, we've detailed we've detailed that. Um, the last thing technical-wise that I really want to talk about is the background, right? You have okay. your room there, kind of the guitar in the background, like kind of breaks up the the, the room. I have my uh, nice – I'm, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to – Black. I have my nice uh, thing here so people know that I'm into video and that makes me like look how cool I am. I have a, a, a video um, a light in my background. How important are these backgrounds when you're shooting videos? Well, I think they're pretty important and actually I wrote about this recently about choosing like the perfect background for your videos because there are a handful of ways you can go. You can go with like a flat background where it's just like a single color. Uh, hopefully not white, but like a like an off color, whether it's a painted wall or a paper paper backdrop or something like that. Uh, maybe a whiteboard. There's some people that stand in front of a whiteboard. I know that Moz does whiteboard Fridays where they're standing there on a whiteboard and they write a bunch of stuff about SEO topics and stuff like that. There's that kind of look, and then there's the I'm in a room kind of look, and often that's bookshelves, desks, um, frames on the wall, stuff like that. And the biggest thing about backgrounds is you don't want them to be too distracting. And there are a few ways that you can combat this. Like the first one would be if there's anything bright or shiny or reflective, like anything with glass in it or a mirror or anything like that, that's going to be distracting because sometimes it'll show the lights you're using or the camera or anything like that. Um, another thing is 
if you're able to distance yourself between you and the background a little bit, then if you're shooting with a camera that has a lower aperture, you can blur that background. So that was one of the things we did in Fizzle a lot was, let's say, let's say the bookshelf is on one side of the room, the camera's on the other side. We're sitting like in the middle of the room so that when the camera's focused on us, the background's blurred out quite a bit. So you don't spend time reading what all the book covers are and stuff like that. You're focused on us as a nice separation between you and the background. And that just comes from shooting at a lower aperture on whatever camera you're using. Oh, I love that. I'm definitely going to steal that. Because I always wondered how you guys did that, and I looked around, and you know, as soon as you start using words like aperture, like I, you know, yeah. even though I have like a, I have a, a, an entry level um, Canon SL1 DSLR, which is like you know beginner's kind of camera, which I'm learning on. But um, oh, that's 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 a really good. Uh, yeah, and I'll just give the URL for the post that I'm talking about. It's just at calebogic.com slash blog slash video dash background. Good. And I'll make sure that I link that up in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, uh, I give a bunch of examples of the different ways to do it, how to get the settings right, and stuff like that. Awesome. And uh, uh, for those listening at home, ryanhanley.com slash show. This is show number 100. We're into three digits now, my friends. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, so ryanhanley.show100 for all the links. And obviously, you can go straight to to Caleb's site as well. I, I I won't hold any hard feelings against you if you do that. Um, if you know how to spell my last name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can also go to Caleb W. Like Caleb you, don't have to, you can give up at the W and just go to the dot com there. What a good idea. That's yeah. such a good idea. Um, all right, so... All right, so let me see here. Sorry, I'm, I I take lots of notes. I know that when you're interviewing people, you're not supposed to be writing at the same time. Um <laughs> But I do that anyways. So yeah, I know yeah. Seth Godin's like, don't write and and talk to people at the same time because then you're not listening to them. I disagree with that. I'm listening to you intently. Uh, so I want to know why not a white backdrop? Because I, the easiest way for me to batch videos has always been the infinity white kind of backdrop look. Mm -hmm. um, you said that might not be the best. Why is that? I'm very interested. Uh, two reasons. The first one is people know that it's supposed to be white, and it can be technically difficult to get it to be exactly white. Gotcha. Um, especially if you're using multiple cameras, and balancing the two white balance-wise can be tough. And mm -hmm. so I prefer to use a color. The second is basically that it doesn't add as much uh, characteristics or branding or anything like that to your videos. Uh, Wistia is an example of a company that uses a plain backdrop, and they use a Savage Paper uh, long paper roll that I'm actually setting up a video studio for myself that has a similar thing. Comes in lots of different cover colors. It's like 45 bucks for a huge roll and you could just cut that and tape it to a wall. You could get something that actually holds it up and you could like roll it down and have different colors to use. Uh, I just think it adds a little bit more texture to the videos if, if there is some color. And the exception to me is like a whiteboard and you're like writing stuff on it. Because mm. if you think about it, someone's watching it on YouTube. YouTube's all white, and then you have white frame, and then you're the only thing. That's that's fine. It'll keep focus on you. I just prefer to have a little bit of color, a little bit of texture, a little bit yeah. of branding in the videos as well. No, that's interesting. I like it. I like it. I, you know, I I uh, I st I'm I'm not ashamed. Um, I straight stole mine from Derek Halpern and his videos. I just liked it. What I liked about it was. As a as a DIYer, it was very in, it was very easy for me to pick that up, right? You 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 oversaturate the backdrop, you light yourself separately, you don't wear white, and you have something that looks very clean. Yeah. Um, but I have found that especially in converting different um, video to different file formats, uploading it to different places, uh, the white. Uh, the oversaturation of the white, like the, the colors will change sometimes and you'll get like some blurring on the edges that can be weird and uh, it definitely is not a perfect format and I, I actually read the post that you just mentioned so I highly recommend anyone who's interested in it go to that post mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I think I'm going to get um, at least one or two colors from uh, that Savage Paper because I do think that that's a, that's a nice look and you can light it up a little differently and give mm -hmm. yourself some feel like Wistia does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is a perfect transition to uh, to next question, which is something that uh, I struggle with. When do we go private hosting, and when do we go YouTube? What 
you know, when is it, and I love Wistia, I use Wistia for my current company, for my, my insurance company, I use it for myself, I love it, I use YouTube as well, but what is the, when do we use one versus the other? I feel like I'm constantly going back and forth on this. I like to think that if someone is paying for videos, then it makes sense to have them privately hosted for a few reasons. One is uh, security, to have them locked down a little bit better. Two is, at any time, YouTube can shut down your channel completely, and you could just lose all of your videos. And I know people that that's happened to. Similar mm -hmm. to, like, Facebook can shut down your Facebook page at any time, and you are kind of SOL at that point. So you want to be able to have control over those videos. And the third is really stats. So if people are paying you to watch a bunch of videos, you want to know which ones they're watching, how long they're watching them. Um, and you can do a lot of custom things with the Wistia player, like maybe a minute into the video, you want to have an email capture for someone to watch the rest of the video. Um, there's that feature there. You can customize your player a little bit more. You're not going to get thumbnails that pop up for people to watch other videos on YouTube about cats or maybe from your competitors. So it makes sense to go to paid hosting when someone's paying for videos. When someone's not paying for videos, it's all about the experience that you want to offer people. If you have the video hosted on, like, or posted on your site, and there is the YouTube player, then unless you put in the specific code for those thumbnails not to show up at the end, then like someone could be distracted at the end and go do something mm -hmm. else. They could also click on on the video when it's playing in a YouTube player. Uh, the name of the video is at the top, and that's a link that goes to watch it on YouTube. And they'll maybe they'll click that link, and they'll go to YouTube, and then they'll go watch something else. So unless you're trying to build the audience on YouTube and to build your subscribers there and have a consistent video uh, publishing schedule and stuff like that, I think that's great. I think YouTube's a great place to get audience growth and to get more people to, to pay attention to you and your business. But I think that there is something to be said about having full control over the experience that someone's having if they're on your website. And I'll use Mazin as, a, as an example again. For their Whiteboard Fridays, they use Wittia on their site. And so if you go to their blog posts about Whiteboard Fridays, the video player is a Wistia player. But they also publish it on YouTube separately, and they get views and people that watch it there. So it's all about being where your people are. If they want to consume it on, their, on your blog, great, you have that option for them. It's a better experience. If they want to subscribe to you on YouTube and watch it that way, you're there for them as well. And so you kind of have to choose what experience you want for your people, what kind of control you want over things. And it's always good to have it in two places just in case YouTube completely shuts down everything and you might lose all of your YouTube videos. Yeah, that would be, man... Yeah, it's hardening if that ever happens. Yeah, of course. yeah, I don't know if they're too apt to shut down a a channel about insurance, which is where I have the most <laughs> most of my work is my former uh, my former insurance agency. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna completely change the topic here, and we're gonna flip over. You are launching a podcast. Um, you briefly mentioned it uh, a few minutes ago, but I want to talk about. Um, uh, and actually, Denver made a comment. Uh, talking about video in audio, does that work? Like, what's this show going to be about? What are people going to be learning? Um, you know, I, I'm always excited to meet. Uh, I know you've podcast for a long time with Fizzle, but you're starting your own show, so it's it's fun, it's exciting, and, and I'm I'm interested to hear about uh, what we're going to get from this new show. Yeah, so it is a little bit of a, a conundrum about talking about video in audio format, and I have gotten feedback from that from like my peers and stuff, and they're like. So how's this going to work? And so I'm kind of working through that process now. But the biggest thing with me in this podcast and then the, like a video show that I'll be doing that will be on YouTube and it'll be like a weekly show, with that I can show I can show the how, like the step-by-step, -step, the tutorial stuff, showing examples of different microphones and lighting and framing and editing and all that kinds of stuff. But in the audio format, I can talk about like the why. So like like we're talking about, like the why you should do video, what kinds of videos you should make, you know, how you can plan out the process of scripting properly and delivering a script. Like a lot of the things we've been talking about here, there wouldn't be much added benefit showing it in video format as well. Whereas like a video show where it's showing the how-tos and stuff, that's a little bit more um, specific in I need some visuals to back up the kinds of things that I'm trying to show people. As, as well as like conversations with people that are using video 
in really good ways online. So it's a combination of those two things. It's the conversations with people as well as the the why and the what behind video as opposed to the how-to stuff that I'll be showing in a video format. Yeah, I mean, I'm down, dude. I, I love it. I think you can take anything to the audio format. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I firmly believe that any topic can be taken to the audio format. And, and, and here's my reason uh, behind that. People, when you're talking, if you're doing a good job, either whether it's conversation or you're telling a story or you're explaining something, there's a movie going on in people's head. So just because they can't see it, video format, if you're doing a good job of explaining a process uh, to them, uh, say say it's just you and the mic, right? You're not doing an interview, and you're just explaining. Here's why you set up this shot this way, and you know I had the light coming in here, and I had to solve how we were going to block that out, and and you're really setting up a a good story in someone's mind who's interested in the topic that you're talking about. There is a video playing in their head, and I think that's unique to the audio format. And uh, it happens too with really well written stories, but it's just. Mm-hmm. It's a little longer to get into that. I think uh, with audio, you, you can get that movie going in people's heads very quickly. So I, I don't think you'll have any problem with it. I'm actually excited about it because um, you're someone that I reference all the time when I'm trying to figure out my own um, <laughs> mess that I have. I shouldn't say mess. It's, we put a lot of work into it. But, um, but you know, you, it's taken me four years to get that studio set up. So mm-hmm. uh, I, I think it's going to be great. I'm excited about it. Where can people get more information about the podcast? Uh, so you can go to DIYvideoguy.com slash podcast, and that'll be where the launches next week as we're recording this live. Um, it should be out by the time people consume this in podcast format, though. Awesome. That's uh, that's really cool. Um, I have one last question. Okay. Uh, Preston, Preston asked it, um, and I'm going to just rework it a little bit. And I want to bring it back. He he asked it before, and I had uh, I had missed it, and and I just found it again. So we're gonna take a step back, but I think it's very interesting. Um, and then we're gonna wrap the show up here. When should you consider a video series, right? When when should we consider a video series? Because I think a lot of people think to themselves, oh, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna do video marketing. And what mm-hmm. is the difference between just Creating videos when necessary, and every week I'm going to pump out a video. Like I think those are two very different things, and what is the thought process behind choosing one versus the other? And I'm giving Preston credit for that question, and I apologize I didn't get to it in the context of our yeah. conversation before. But I think that the biggest thing is, like, what do you have capacity for? I think that you should start with figuring out maybe what the five to ten videos are that would be most helpful to your audience or uh, most helpful to explaining what you do to your customers or showcasing whatever it is you do, those five to ten videos might make the most sense to get started with because you want to have you want to have that baseline. And it might not make sense to start out like a video show or a series with those kinds of videos. Like your your trailer about your company, your sales page things, uh, your about video, stuff like that. As as far as like when to go into a series, I would think it just whatever you have capacity to do. If you don't have capacity to make a video every week, then you shouldn't commit to a series or a show or something like that. But that doesn't mean you can't have an ongoing video presence if it's not weekly. Like That's not the only way you can do it. You could just commit to a different sort of schedule, whether that's twice a month or once a month or what have you. You can still have some sort of series. But I think until you sit down and you figure out what this thing looks like in 10, 20, 30 episodes of it, and you know what titles of all of those things are, it might not make sense to commit to a new show or a new series if you only have like two or three ideas of what you would actually make for it. So listing out episode titles and stuff like that is a good way to know whether or not you have something more substantial on your hand. Great. Caleb, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, I appreciate you coming and sharing all this information uh, with with us as far as, you know, this is video format that we're doing right now. Obviously, I'm a big fan of it. Um, You know, there's a lot of different things that we can do with this. I, I like it because there's text allows you to be creative, but there's limitations. Audio allows you to be creative, but again, there's some limitations. I feel like there are far less limitations when it comes to video. There's so many different ways we can chop this thing up and repurpose mm-hmm. and reuse, mm-hmm. um, and just, it almost seems like, uh, 
uh, you know, this, your imagination is the only limitation to what you can do when it comes to, to video yeah, and, and the content that we can create. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that you can do so much with it. So. Yeah. What? Um, where should people find out? We told them about the podcast. Where would be the best place to, to connect with you? Uh, the best place to connect with me is at DIYvideoguy.com. Uh, from there, that goes to the blog and the podcast and video show and all that stuff as well. There's a little hire me link there that takes me or takes you to Kill Logic Films if you are interested in doing any production or strategy stuff with me. Awesome. Caleb, thank you. Everyone who uh, is here live or listens later, this has been our 100th show. I want to thank all of you for spending so much time with me. Uh, 100 shows is something I never thought would have been possible when, uh, when I created this thing back in August of 2012. Uh, we've had so many amazing guests. Caleb, I'm so happy that we finally could add you to uh, our directory of thought leaders and there isn't a better topic to talk about than video marketing for our 100th episode. With that, everyone, thank you, and we are out.